beginning part of building the MVP wasn't really covered, so. It ha- since I've been here it hasn't been. I've I've focused I've focused on the beginning. Yeah, um Which was really dope. Kind of outlining what it is. The discovery process and then actually going yeah. in depth on that. That sounds good to me. So um and this is stuff that I've yeah, provide examples for just basically what we've done, so that'll be an activity. Perfect. Um, so we'll get started a little bit after 12, so if you want to grab a bite, you're more than welcome to. Um, usually our attendees arrive like right at 12 or a little bit after. I assume so. Yeah, they're on the late show usually. Um, so we're going to live stream today's session and then I'm also doing a video recording. Live stream. Yes, very exciting on YouTube. Um, so for today, your camera angles, we have three set up, um, two wide and one kind of close range. So if you just want to stay kind of a little bit in front of these banners and then up till about this tape line here, um, yeah. anything farther will be like right in front of the projector. Okay. Um, in between the tape? Yeah. Yep. Um, I mean, you're welcome to walk up and down the aisles if you're like, I don't want to be on camera right now. It's <laughs> fine. Um, and then because the, we don't have um, environment mics set up, so if the audience has a question, if you could just repeat the question Got aloud. And I'll wave in the back to remind you in case you forget. Most of our presenters kind of okay. forget about the yep. recording, but yep. get you plugged in here. I know they're always so stuck. <laughs> Do you have any fun plans for the weekend? I might go surfing. So oh, that's so awesome. Over yeah. in like La Push or? Uh, normally we go up to like Westport or the Canal. Oh, that's awesome. Works for me. Okay. Whatever is most comfortable for you. Pocket is fine with me. Okay. Loop it through. Perfect. So it needs to go, I'm assuming, like here. Yeah, and then I can tuck this in for you. Okay. So, actually. Yeah, Mike, do you want me to do it? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Let me go. Go out here, and then I'll have you test in just a second. Perfect. Sorry. <laughs> nope, you're good. All right. Uh, you just want the switch. Um, oh, actually, I'm going to have you, um, there's a mute switch on the top of, yep. yeah, so you just want to click that back and then. Is that better? I'm going to be talking about an MLP. Oh, there it is. Hear it now. Now I'm on. Now I'm on. So much power. There we go. <laughs> it's always funny hearing your voice.
Hey, thanks for coming. Um, we're going to still have people trickling in, uh, so I'm going to go ahead and get started talking because I talked for a couple of minutes, and uh, then we're going to move right on to Jack. Um, so after this presentation, we're going to have Bin Vong and Alex Balaka from the Entrepreneurial Law Clinic talking about AR and VR. Um, if you don't know the Entrepreneurial Law Clinic, it is a law clinic here at the University of Washington. It does uh, free legal meetings and advice for startups. It's a fantastic program. Uh, you go to the UW Law School, you get matched up with a student. The student is working with a supervising attorney for from whom they can ask questions and get clarification on stuff. So you're not just talking to a law student, you're also talking to the attorney. Uh, it works for them, it works for us. It's fantastic for all the parties. So uh, please take adva advantage of the Entrepreneurial Law Clinic. And speaking of that, uh, this is the last ELC presentation of the year. Uh, one of the nice things about the ELC presentations is that the students come, make their presentation, they bring their supervising attorney with them, and so a lot of the time at the end of those, if you haven't been to one, uh, people just ask legal questions, and so you can get your free legal advice today, today only, um, last ELC of the year. Next week, we're going to have uh, Looney Libs talking about mentoring 55 startups. If you don't know him, he runs Fledge and Aviary, uh, which are I an accelerator and a funding group um, for startups that are trying to make a big difference in the world. And he's going to be talking about mentoring. And if there's anybody who knows anything about mentoring, it's Looney. So he's going to be really fantastic. Uh, and then Patrick Gray, who actually works here in the incubator with Pascal um, uh, Biomedical is going to be talking about biotech startups the week after that, which is uh, May 12th. But today, we have Jack Mellinger. Um, he's going to be talking about minimum viable product today. And Jack is a entrepreneur with a lifelong commitment to impact. He currently serves as principal and co-founder of Capria. Um, Capria runs a, an accelerator for uh, people who manage impact funds and runs it, it seems like, all over the world? Or, or people come from all over the world for it? Yeah, and he's going to discuss um, building out your product and doing discovery. All right, thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. How's everybody doing? Good. Good. Um, so before I go ahead and get started, uh, I wanted to just get a sense of who's in the room and what brought you all here. So um, I, I could talk the entire time, but that wouldn't ne be nearly as fun. Uh, so I just want to get a sense of what brought you all here today. So just if a couple people could share, you know, what, what their interest is and, and what they'd like to get out of the conversation here, I can also uh, tailor things as we go. And uh, at the end, rather than just kind of walk through some of uh, my experience and, and what I've learned throughout this process of building MVPs, I'd like to really engage you um, in, in more of kind of an activity around that so we can facilitate a conversation. So. What brings you all here? Anyone? Yeah? Uh, my name is Jeff Randolph. I'm the founder of a company called Azorius Real Estate Platform. Okay. We're, we're very early stage. Um, we're working primarily on, on customer development right now. Great. Um, uh, strictly adhering to lean customer development and uh, trying, to, trying to basically get all of our um, value proposition laid out before we develop our MVP. All right. Real estate development company and getting ready to launch, going through the lean startup process. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, my name is Jeremy. Uh, I'm an MBA student at Boston School of Business. And uh, one reason I'm here is I worked with a startup over the summer and I continue working with them, but I recently broke up with them. And the reason I broke up with them could probably be boiled down to, well, do we really understand, like, do we really know that this product and this market are going to fit together? And it's like, can we do this? Can, can we test this out cheaper than we're going to test it out? All right, recovering from a startup breakup and, and looking, at, uh, looking at how to generate product market fit. Great. Anyone else? All right. Well, we'll go ahead and roll with that and, and dive in here. So you might be a little bit surprised on never building your MVP, but I'll, I'll get to that in a minute and, and uh, why I've positioned it that way. To give you a little bit of background, I guess, in context, relative to where I'm coming from. So I've been involved with um, both startups as well as uh, large companies and, and existing organizations and have really kind of gone through this process both in terms of 
uh, building new, th new things and, and new companies, but also building kind of new products uh, within existing entities. So I'm hoping that even those of you who might be in the audience already at an existing uh, firm can kind of apply some of these concepts and these principles uh, to what you do uh, as your company looks to continue to innovate and remain relevant. Um, a couple of the a couple of the organizations I've worked with uh, are are there up on the screen. Uh, you actually heard Kira mention Looney. Uh, I had the opportunity to actually work with Looney um, to look at building out Kick, which was uh, designed to uh, kind of meet the needs of people that weren't quite ready for Fledge, and so we went through a discovery design kind of research process with with them uh, and with him directly to really ro roll out uh, a program that then scaled. Uh, I believe to a couple dozen countries uh, in a relatively short period of time. Um, as Kira mentioned, uh, my, my latest venture uh, is one that got started uh, roughly two years ago. Um, and some of the things I'm going to be talking about today and the example that I'm going to provide really directly relate to that and, and how we thought about going about kind of building, building our, um, not MVP, but MLP. So MLP, minimum lovable product. So uh, why, would, why would you build anything if, it, if it's just barely viable? Why not build something that's lovable? Um, obviously, it's a, it's a slight twist, but there's a, there's a good medium post on this. And uh, I, thought it, I thought it was relevant just in terms of you know, bu building things that are meaningful and relevant uh, to whoever you're trying to reach and for whatever problem you're trying to solve. So we'll, we'll get, get into this uh, a little bit, but um, you know, I think the, the definition there is pretty uh, pretty straightforward, and uh, the, the goal here is to you know, figure out how to right-size the amount of energy and, and time and resources that you're placing into developing, uh, developing that MVP or MLP. So um, just in terms of a uh, recap or kind of agenda, uh, a couple of the sessions, uh, maybe you all attended them, maybe you didn't, um, but the, a couple of the sessions that are probably directly relevant to some of the stuff we're talking about. Um, I kind of highlighted here, I know Brian was in uh, talking about the Lean Canvas. Um, we've worked together on a number of things. I'm gonna lightly hit on the Lean Canvas, but try and focus on how that ties into to getting to the, uh, to the MLP. And then um, before we really dive in uh, fully on, uh, on the MLP kind of process and, and getting there, I wanted to just kind of set the stage Relative to um, uh, relative to uh, you know the startup environment, some common mistakes that that I've seen and also uh, done myself, um, and then we'll we'll kind of dive in from there. Uh, I'm sure you all have your own definitions of, of startups, but uh, really temporary organizations really reinventing themselves continuously is is the the way that I think about that and. And uh, if, if you don't have that mindset, it's really, really hard to uh, remain relevant and build your business and grow. So that, that mindset really translates and, and directly influences this MLP process that we're going to go ahead and get into. So to really get started, uh, I think the, the thing that I wanted to emphasize is, is really a, a deep understanding. So uh, it's Jeremy. So Jeremy was mentioning uh, just a, an experience with the startup around not necessarily knowing if you have the right product market fit. Um, to some extent, uh, there, there's some things that are natural within that to, to not necessarily quite know. Um, but I think the, the important thing is, is that you're, you're actually you know, getting out there and, and understanding, uh, taking the understanding of you know, the problem that you're trying to solve and, uh, and not going off into you know, your own dark cave and, and hole to try and figure it out. Um, but you're actually getting out there to, to listen to people and to, to actually hear what people think about uh, you know, how you're thinking about the problem, um, as well as uh, how you're thinking about engaging them uh, in kind of solving that. So um, the kind of basic uh, just trajectory and, and to kind of orient people to where I'm going to focus, um, kind of looking at the three kind of stages from startup to growth, uh, really focusing on uh, this, this, the MVP process specifically or MLP process uh, within this startup phase. So I'm not really going to hit on, um, you know, how do you, how do you take the MVP 
um, and, then, and then transition into those next two phases. I'm really gonna focus on the front end <coughs> of, the, of the MVP or MLP development. Can you talk about channels? Channels. Uh, channels, where are you pointing? Oh, third term. Yeah, channels. So, uh, you know, how are you, how you're actually reaching uh, your end users, your customers, and, and the people that you're going to be engaging with. So that's the, that's the reference there. So I wanted to uh, just get, get your feedback and, and thoughts uh, real quickly as I, as I provide an example on what the most common mistakes that you think are out there relative to building an, an MVP or an MLP. Just a couple of quick ideas. I can also talk the entire time if people don't want to. Not yeah. actually addressing any risks or assumptions. So like talking before risk. Not addressing risks or assumptions. Okay. Yep. Not connecting with your market. Not connecting with your market. Questions firsthand. Surveys. Not asking questions firsthand interactions yeah. surveys etc. Yep. Any others? There's only two. Okay, maybe a more pointed question will help. So if you were to look at this, this is from, um, uh, from an accelerator in India, actually. So um, with, with Capria, we manage, um, we manage multiple investment funds. One of our funds is focused on India, so they're deeply embedded in the ecosystem there, uh, which is part of where this presentation comes from. But this is an accelerator in India, and one of the things that they've done is they've actually kind of mapped out you know, ten, 10 different stages to, uh, to be able to get to that kind of pr proof point or product market fit. And so um, on this, what, what's, what's one of the things that you notice relative to where they've placed uh, MVP, what we're calling MLP for today? Can everyone see that? I'll dance around, move up. Anyone? Yeah? I see Jeremy's about to jump in. Customers before the product, that's a good one. Any other, any other, what about where the business plan's placed? So what I've seen and what I've done, um, uh, when, I was a, when I was a student um, and, and uh, at university, had a, had a great idea for uh, something that I wanted to build and went off with uh, with some of my some of my friends. We uh, you know we thought our idea was great. We went straight into uh, developing the business plan, and we went through the entire process. Had a great you know pretty 15 20 page document, um, and then and then we took that and then we went out there and we found out that most of it was either not relevant or didn't work, and so. Um, I bring this to the forefront because uh, I think too, uh, way too often people take their ideas and since, uh, since we're all entrepreneurs or aspiring entrepreneurs, we think they're the greatest ideas in the world um, and that everyone's going to adopt them and they're, they're, uh, they're just going to scale up uh, naturally and, and people are going to adopt, uh, adopt whatever product or service it is that we're offering. And uh, I have never experienced uh, or, or really seen people that just go lock themselves up and develop a business plan and then magically come out with, with a lot of different customers. So, um, so I think I'd, I just wanted to highlight that one. You've probably heard it before, but uh, I don't think it can, can really be stated enough. And it, it, it's certainly uh, probably one of the top things to really focus on. So you've, you've seen this, or if you haven't seen this, uh, you should look at this uh, with the with the lean lean startup or the like lean canvas, um, and it's really not just about the product; it's about the business. And so, you know, thinking about the canvas as kind of two sided, um, where where you have your your product and your market, um, and you need to figure out how all of those really come together in in a in a seamless fashion. And uh, for for the purposes of the afternoon here. We really wanted to focus on was you know problem customer segments, and then we can we can talk a little bit about channels, um, but honing in on uh, the customer segments, how you how you actually take your interaction with potential customers, 
and then uh, move forward in, in developing your product and, and refining what you're going to be able to provide to them. So, um, so I think uh, you've, uh, you've all kind of seen that. that we're going to focus on the, the three different areas there to develop the, the unique proposition. Uh, I don't know if any of you have, have any of you had the pleasure of interacting with, with Sandy? Um, he has a good, good, uh, good quote there just around, um, you know, if, if, uh, if customers aren't kicking and screaming when you, when you would take the product away, then you probably haven't built that, that MLP. Um, and, and, um, and so I think that's, that's the, really the thing to keep in mind. Um, we've, we've already kind of emphasized talking, uh, talking or um, really focusing on, on the customers themselves. Um, but I think that the, the important thing here is, is that it's, it's an iterative process. Um, it's something that you're really going to be constantly be doing. Uh, it's not just going to be a month long. It's not going to be three months. Uh, it's going to be multiple years that you're, you're probably going through this in, in different fashions and uh, in different phases. And, um, and so, uh, you know, as you're kind of entering into this process of your de developing your MLP or MVP, I think that's one thing to really keep in mind um, is, is that it's, it's not a static state um, where you go out, you talk to a couple customers, and then uh, you go back to the drawing board, you release something. Uh, it really is uh, dynamic, iterative, and uh, something that is quite the, uh, quite the roller coaster ride relative to, to developing that. This is where everybody wants to be. We've developed the product. We have our audience and, and our market out there. So let's, let's get the word out broadly, and, and we're ready to go. Uh, but it takes a long time to get here. And so that's where that, this is where we're going to focus today. And, and um, uh, are you, all of you familiar with the concept of, the, of pivot? I see mostly nods yes. So, um, you know, taking what you're learning and then figuring out if you need to go in, into in a, in a different direction, kind of building on what you've learned. Uh, sometimes that means completely reinventing yourself or dropping the idea of the whole and starting, starting fresh. Um, but you're still, you're still basing what you do based, um, on what you learned. So, um, so we'll get into this. Uh, and, uh, and I think the, the problem solution fit is where I would like to remain focused. Um, as, you, as you kind of move into stage two, we're not going to cover this too much. Uh, we're not going to cover this today, but you know, you'll, hear, you'll, you'll hear about things like net promoter scores and, and, think, uh, and other, other kind of buzzwords or acronyms. Um, I'm going to try to avoid um, some, I'm going to try to avoid those and really uh, focus on the, the tangible kind of steps uh, that, that I've experienced and, and that I've taken when, when going out to uh, really create that, uh, that MLP. So I think a, a visual helps um, relative to comparing the two. And uh, th this, is how, this is how you differentiate between the, the MVP and the MLP. Um, I see a couple people moving and, and shifting to try and, try and take a look at that. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I think it's, it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, so you can either focus on trying to build something everything everyone loves, which is often the problem um, that, that people run into, or you can focus on building something that a very focused group loves. And, and I think this is one of the, one of the hardest dances to do, to do as, you're, as you're considering what you're going to build, is, uh, is you know, who, who are those people there on the right hand uh, of this of this graph and and you know how what is what is the sweet spot there uh, and there unfortunately there's no quick easy answer uh, and it's something they really just have to experience go do uh, and experiment with in, in order to in, in order to find that find that sweet spot for yourself and what you're looking to accomplish so uh, I like this example relative to the, the MVP and the MLP. So if you were looking to, to build a delicious cake or cupcake, uh, the MVP could just be that, that, uh, that very plain, uh, plain piece of cake. Um, but, if, but if you're looking to build an MLP, you're probably, 
you're probably adding some other things on there that, that people would uh, really be attracted to and enjoy. Um, so I'm sure everybody loves cupcakes, and if not, <laughs> that was a bad example. So um, the, the discovery process and, and, and why it's so important, I mean, it really influences everything that you do. Um, being customer-centric and, and knowing what you need to deliver ultimately is what, you, is what dictates your, your success as a startup. And, and so this process here is one that um, I wanted to really go through and break down into essentially uh, six steps. Uh, could expand much further on that. Uh, we could go deeper in the Q&A to the extent that you all would like. Uh, but uh, I'm going to take this uh, and, and actually uh, pull out individual pieces uh, here over the next 10 minutes or so um, in order to, to highlight just a couple of, differ uh, couple of different things. So one question I have for you, though, as, as you think about building your MVP, your MLP, is when you're going to go through your discovery process, your customer discovery process, are you selling? Is that sales? No. No. I hear no. Does anyone disagree with no? Yes. Oh, we have no and a yes. Does anyone have maybe? Okay, trying, I, hear, I hear yes, trying, not trying to push something you have, you're trying to figure out what they want, I hear no. So no, not what everybody wants is not what they need. This is a good discussion. I think you're always selling. If you're presenting yourself to a prospective customer, mm -hmm. whether it's in the discovery or you have a semblance of product, you're always trying to present yourself as a solution provider to whatever situation that they may be going through. Okay. So we have no, yes, and you're always selling if you're engaging with people. One more, and then want to want to make sure we're, we're moving through here. This is a good one. It's only yes if you're doing your job right. So this was interesting. We hit the full spectrum. That was great. Um, so my view on this is that you kind of are selling. Uh, so to, to your point, what's your name? Mike. Mike. So to Mike's point, um, you're, you're always selling if you're interacting with a potential customer. As you're going through a discovery process, what's your ultimate goal? To figure out who your potential customer is. So as you're going through that process, you don't know if some of those people that you're interacting with will be customers or not, because you haven't actually figured out who that target audience is or what the right product market fit is. And what, what I have done in, in my experience with this is that it's actually used to really build up your sales funnel and, and your pipeline of potential customers um, and doing that in a very prescriptive fashion. So it's not, it's not necessarily used for sales, but if you end up moving forward and building something that meets the needs of a segment of those people that you were doing discovery with, then you already have your starting place relative to the people that you're looking to sell to and close. So there's a, there's a bit of a, a nuance there as you go through that process, and it's really, really, really hard to do to not want to move into sales. So I think the mindset is, no, I'm here to understand. However, 
I am, all, if I'm engaging with anyone and want to potentially actually sell them in the future, then I need to kind of have that sales hat on. Maybe it's backwards at the time or something. But so, um, so that's, that's always one that I think will spark debate and people have different opinions on it as was shown here in this room. But, um, but I think, that, um, I think that, that that's the approach that I've taken. You can take it, make it your own. There are a lot of different ways to do discovery. You can read about a whole slew of things um, and, and, a, and a lot of different approaches. The, the, th the thing that I've focused on throughout my career is actually engaging directly with people in conversation. Uh, you can take, you know, you can leverage technology and other platforms to really, you know, scale that up to get much, much, much more feedback. Uh, it's probably going to be less in depth, um, but, you know, that's certainly something you consider. But I spent, uh, for, for Capria, when we were launching Capria, I spent countless hours on the phone with people all over the world. Uh, I think I talked to 150 different people and um, probably 15 to 20 different countries um, to really go through the discovery uh, design and research process. And, uh, and that was on Skype, that was on phone calls, that was in person. And uh, you know, that could be anywhere from, I would say, a half hour conversation to an hour. Um, but, it, but anything less than that's really hard to, uh, to kind of get uh, the level of depth that you, that you probably likely want to get uh, relative to this process. So that's, that's kind of what I've experienced just uh, in, uh, in my time doing this work is that you know, it takes roughly uh, 50 to 100. And I'm, that is also dependent on the type of product or service that you're looking to offer. Um, but 50 to 100, and then you'll start to really see patterns, and, and you'll start to you know, get ready to jump on the call or go to the meeting, and uh, you kind of walk into it thinking, oh, I'll bet that the answer to this question is going to be one of these three things uh, or one of these five things. And uh, it's not to say that you're not always learning something new, but uh, you, you start to see those patterns kind of unfold. So... So that's a, a fairly specific and practical one. Um, so I was intending to do this a bit as an exercise. We could also just make it a little bit more of a discussion. Uh, but what uh, do people have ideas that they're currently working on? I know we have one with a real estate company. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, well, if it, wasn't, if it wasn't ambitious, it'd be boring, right? Yeah. So we got one person in the process of filing a patent and, and uh, getting some people to work on a couple of things as they're going through it. So natural language processing applied to finance. Great. And where, where are you at in your process? Um, I am still in the middle of our work product. Okay. Uh, and getting ready to take that live. Okay. And talking with our customers and their investors. Uh, let's see. Actually, the problem I have is I have three, I have two customers here and one customer. And I can't just pick up because they're something else. Okay, so building MVP, but challenged by the fact that there's two users, one customer, and it's hard to reach the customer. Okay, great. So obviously it all starts with an idea. We have a couple of ideas in the room, um, and uh, this could also apply within an existing organization, so it doesn't have to be a brand new startup. Um, I think the uh, step two that I recommend is actually releasing your attachment to that idea so that you can effectively go through your discovery process. 
uh, one of the hardest things to do is um, to not get overly attached to the idea because then what happens is you go from I'm out there doing discovery to all of a sudden you're doing sales. And then, um, and then you're, you're in, in a place where you're building something without necessarily knowing uh, if you're going to ultimately uh, be reaching the right people or building the right thing. So, um, so as any, uh, I, there's been at least one in the room who's, who's sounds like they've experienced kind of moving through this too quickly. Uh, but th this one requires a little bit of practice um, and being humble. So um, step three, uh, defining your discovery process. So how many people have actually um, really fully mapped out a discovery process and then driven it start to finish? Anyone? Yeah? Mike has. Okay. Jeff? Great. Okay. Okay. Great. So you've done it within an existing organization? Okay, so we have a couple of people who've who've gone through that or are going through that right now. So I'm interested to to hear how how your experience kind of maps to to what I'm about to outline. So what what I have done um, and and what I have there is problem, solution, purpose, hypotheses, assumptions, and then questions, and you're you're categorizing those questions. So relative to a problem, uh, I wanted to go ahead and just make this tangible. So when we were uh, getting ready to launch Capria, uh, we identified the problem as this. There's an inadequate supply of capital available uh, for impact entrepreneurs, particularly in emerging markets. Um, and, um, and then in conjunction with that, there's insufficient support structures in place for the people that want to launch the funds that are going to actually address that need. So, there's a lot to, lot to kind of unpack within that. Um, the first place we started is obviously you know, doing, doing your desk research, doing your homework there. Uh, I think that one's pretty obvious, that one's pretty straightforward. Um, plenty of resources out there for most things that, that, you're gonna be, that you're gonna be looking at or exploring. Did I do something? All right, it's, it's, uh, it, it's a problem. So, you know, we're on the problem slide. It was just, <laughs> just trying to be cooperative. So, um, so after, after you've kind of clearly defined that, you know, what, what do you think your potential solution is? You know, generally pencil that out. Um, and, uh, and in this case, uh, it was, you know, for, from our perspective, kind of looking at the different things going on through, throughout emerging markets relative to uh, impact investing, our focus was going to be on okay. Now, how do we how do we hone in on the uh, the people that were launching impact funds and uh, and be able to provide them with uh, with a suite of services and support um, as deeply connected partners to help them be successful. Okay, so mapped out our problem. We have kind of our proposed solution. Don't know if that's necessarily the answer. We move through. Um, and define the purpose of our discovery. So did this in, in a, a good amount of detail, um, but it kind of starts to list out some of the things that you want to learn along the way. Maybe those, maybe those might be a bit outside of, um, you know, a bit outside of some of the, those key questions that you, that you want to answer, um, but just clearly defining that for yourself um, and, and getting that down on paper so that everybody on your team is also in sync uh, as they get out there. Now, from there, the hypothesis. Um, this, one, this one can be tricky, particularly when you're dealing with multiple different segments. Um, and so one of the things that we actually dealt with relative to Capria is that we, in this kind of problem solution statement, one thing that's also present within that and embedded within that is that there's the other side of the equation, not the fund manager, but the people that would be investing in the fund manager. And so is, is there actually you know, adequate supply of capital on that side? So we actually had to really kind of do two, two of these in parallel um, and, and focus one on the potential investors that would be investing in the fund managers and the other on the fund managers um, because in, in some ways you can think of our work as kind of a, a two-sided marketplace. Um, which is which is never an easy thing, uh, never e an easy thing to balance. So I think 
the, the more precise you can make uh, you know, your hypothesis and the more you can really hone in, even if there are a lot of different elements, if you can tease those elements out, um, that's, that's going to certainly be helpful and, and save you a lot of time as you go through your process. So then questions. Um, I, I um, really I recommend you know, basically listing out um, all kinds of questions that you have. Um, and actually, uh, I actually forgot to mention, along with the hypothesis, a really, really important point here is to identify your assumptions going into it so that you know, you know where, your, where your bias kind of lies. And, and I think that um, by, by mapping out those assumptions, you'll avoid running into a couple things where uh, you're going through your discovery process and you're, you're kind of either dismissing or not listening to certain pieces of what a potential customer might be telling you because you've already assumed that those are those are guaranteed um, and those are already in place. So really, really listing out those assumptions in full is, is a also a key part of that process. So with the, with the questions and, and really categorizing those questions, the key thing here is that as you're categorizing those, and this is how we did it with Capria, uh, we were looking at uh, everything from the background and experience of, uh, of our fund, of potential fund managers. So were there actually people out there that had the type of background and experience uh, that, we thought, um, that we thought was there? Uh, some people actually, you know, when we set out into this process, they were like, nope, there, there's, not, there's not an adequate supply of, of local uh, people trying to launch impact investment firms. So we wanted to get a sense of what type of experience did people actually have? Did they have you know, two years of investing experience? Did they have 10? Were they working at an existing firm? Uh, we really wanted to, to deeply, deeply get to know them. So back to, the, back to that deep understanding piece. Um, the, other, the other things that we looked at here, um, really, it was, it was quite a range within each of these. Um, and we probably had, uh, I think, it was 10 to 15 questions for each of these different buckets. Obviously, you're not going to get to all of those within the context of a half an hour or, or an hour long conversation. So uh, flagging which ones are the most critical and the ones that you absolutely, you know, you just have to know. If, if you only got five of them, which five would that be? Um, so really kind of stack ranking uh, the, the questions that you're going to ask kind of going through your process is something that, um, something that I found helpful. The, the, other, the other thing that uh, I wanted to point out with uh, categorizing the questions and, and really clearly defining those and outlining them is uh, being able to go through and do some kind of quantitative analysis. So this, is, this is, can be challenging um, and can be difficult depending on the types of questions that you're asking. Um, but really being able to go back through and let's say you talk to 100 people, um, what were the key trends in each of these buckets? And, and, uh, and then how, how are those key trends influencing your thinking? Um, the value proposition piece uh, that, that I've uh, put up here in terms of our, uh, one of the ways that we categorized, was our means of really asking, asking the potential fund managers, if they were potential fund managers, um, or if they were investors, um, what they, w you know, how they've experienced uh, some of what we were looking to offer. So it wasn't necessarily a direct question on, would you buy this, right? Uh, it was more nuanced and, and associated with their experience with other, th other kind of things like that. So other services like that, other products like that, um, which really gives you, um, gives you, I think, a better picture um, of what their, what their needs, what their wants might be, um, which you won't know until you actually deliver something to them. But, um, but I think that that's, that's one important thing that I've learned. Yeah. Yeah, so certainly. So uh, initially, we started off, um, and 
the I think the the overarching you know problem really remained consistent relative to what we were looking to solve. So that was that was consistent. The the solution piece was one where I, I think we had specific things in mind that we would offer to uh, particular fund managers. And uh, we were thinking about that relative to some back office support in order to be able to streamline things so, so that they could uh, really get up and running more quickly um, and taking kind of all of that administrative burden off their plate. Um, and uh, and the, that was one kind of core piece of how we were thinking about it initially. Now, as we started talking to potential managers and, and talking to investors, what we, what we kind of realized was there's a whole slew of people that are, that are already kind of handling uh, that aspect of it. And each, each manager, whether, uh, whether they were already established or new, was really already thinking about a couple of different options in the market. And those options actually, you know, we looked at them and we're, we kind of said, those, those kind of seem sufficient. That's not, doesn't really seem like a value add. And so um, we started looking really more holistically and throughout those conversations ended up really kind of taking that away and viewing it more on how to bring in best practices across the continuum of building a fund and being successful uh, in launching an investment firm. And that really only evolved as, as we were having these conversations over and over. And then from there, what we were able to do is we took, you know, if you ask, uh, my running joke is, is if you ask a fund manager uh, what they need, what do you think the first, uh, the first three responses would be? This is probably true of almost any entrepreneur. Customers, capital, more capital, and access to capital. So that was pretty much the response that we were getting. And so, you know, it took a little bit of coaxing to, to get them to go further. Um, but my, my point in highlighting that is we knew that that was top of mind for fund managers, and it always would be. No matter what we did, if somebody's trying to launch a fund, the first thing they're gonna think about is how, how do I actually reach the investors? And so we took that and we really positioned it within our messaging when we went out publicly um, to draw them in and then be able to introduce them to all the other components of what we were able to offer them. So, so that, that's kind of expanding on your question a bit, but does that answer, answer your question? Correct. And then you evolved in how you were going to address that problem. Maybe yep. And it's common sense, but it's something people forget. To it, it is common sense. It's also really challenging, again, to not be attached. Because, we're, I mean, we're still, we're still evolving. You know, we've been at this for, for two years. Uh, we went out uh, publicly uh, in late 2015. Um, and, you know, since that time, we've been able to, to raise capital. We've been able to... Um, begin working with managers, uh, but the way that we're working with managers has continued to evolve. And as, a, the, as we've refined how we work with managers in order to deliver more value to them, the, our messaging is also evolving. And so it's really been this constant process. And so when, when we launched, we launched as the first global accelerator for impact fund managers. We actually knew that that messaging wasn't actually adequate to capture what we what we were really looking to be as a company or what we were looking to offer. Um, but it was enough to orient people to something new that was being introduced to the market. All right, so I'm gonna run through these last three pretty quickly. Uh, I wanna make sure to leave time for any kind of general questions. So uh, developing your list of uh, discovery pros prospects. Uh, this would be looking at uh, the different assumptions you have around your, uh, your customer segments. And, and I, I've always found it helpful to really uh, profile and develop at least three personas of, of the uh, of, you know, potential customers that you think are the absolute ideal if, if, uh, if they you know, came, to, came to your door tomorrow. That is exactly who you would want to see. Um, it, it's, a, it's an exercise that really uh, forces you to, to, to think a lot uh, about kind of, you know, 
um, who you want to actually put on the short list for you know those 50 to 100 people. So, um, so that that's one one thing to to think about. And then uh, listen, learning, and tracking. You know, I I uh, mentioned that before, um, but as you go through that process, it's it's not enough to just you know sit down and have a conversation. Uh, you really want to be systematic around what you're collecting and how you're collecting it, so that you can go, uh, so that you can go back to that information, revisit that information, and and think about how it influences uh, what you might be introducing. Um, in, in terms of a, a different example, since Looney's going to be in here uh, next, as we were looking at what to do with Kick, um, and as quick background on that. Uh, we, were, we were basically trying to take some of the curriculum and some of the ways that they engaged through the, uh, through the incubator that, uh, that he had and apply that to people that weren't ready to enter, uh, to enter into that incubator. So was there a product that we could take that was almost a light version that would serve as pipeline for, for the larger effort? We developed a... Uh, um, uh, you know, a hypothesis, we kind of identified what we were looking to solve and what the potential solution would be. And then um, we created a list, of probably scraped, uh, I don't know, a couple hundred um, potential customers or people that we thought might be potential customers at some point um, off of uh, different lists. So we were looking at uh, different co-working spaces and shared spaces that might be looking to offer programs to people that were coming through the space. Um, we were looking at uh, different kind of entrepreneurs that were engaged in the community who might want want to be involved with uh, you know being a thought leader uh, there and and might be interested in licensing you know part of the curriculum to use within their efforts. So we came up with the we we came up with that list. And then we kind of uh, segmented that. Um, and then as we were going through the discovery process, we, um, we would, you know, we were listening and learning and we would adjust where we were having conversations um, as we were getting a sense of which, which audience um, it, it, you know, we thought was kind of really more in the, in the sweet spot, so to speak, uh, of what we were thinking about creating. Um, and so that's, that's the way that we approach that. I um, already hit that. Um, follow up, uh, if they're gonna be your potential customers someday, or even if they're not, uh, they might send you people that you could be speaking to or connect with. They're gonna have other ideas for you. Uh, you've heard it over and over. People still forget to do it. Always ask for referrals. Who else can I be talking to about this? Do you have any ideas based on uh, some of the things that you learned today? Um, I found it helpful to specify a specific number or be you know, very tangible um, so that people just don't have to think. People don't like thinking most of the time. Um, so that, that's, uh, that's just a quick reminder. And ultimately, uh, where, where it leads, are, are, you ready, are you ready to actually launch? So do you have a sense of what you're going to go out and build? Um, and, uh, and I think that um, with, the, with the MLP reference, the only thing that I don't like about that is I think when you, th when you think minimum lovable product, uh, you're, you're probably working at that for, for a really long time. It's never going to be perfect. There's always going to be things that are wrong with it. And uh, you'll get that feedback uh, once you actually get it in the hands of, of your customers and your stakeholders. So I tried to cover um, a good, good portion of ground here. We have about f a little more than five minutes left, but I want to answer any questions and then I can stay for, uh, for a little while after to the extent that people want to chat further. Yeah? Right. Um, I mean, so tabling the CRM conversation, because that, that's all, of, of course, eventually you want to get everything into a CRM. I haven't come across any, uh, any tools that, you know, are just 
extremely dialed in to, uh, to this kind of process or approach. I mean, a CRM would work fine. Um, and there's low cost options. Um, some are better than others. Uh, but, you know, the spreadsheets usually would work fine. If you're going to take the approach of 50 to 100 people and actually have calls, and you've been able to map out and those those specific areas, maybe the 10 to 15 buckets, and then within each of those, you you know you have your standard replies or your other, and you're um, and you're doing that. That uh, that that'll that'll work just fine. Um, I think the thing you'd have to be careful about in investing in a tool would be: um, Are you investing in a tool that you're not going to end up using for <coughs> in, in the future? Um, so uh, so the short answer is no, but um, I, I think a CRM, depending on how you're building it, could work. Spreadsheets work fine, too. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the lead books say, don't, don't do anything that's too complicated. Yeah. Yeah. Google Docs. Sim simple yep. I mean, Google Docs has its own, like, it's a big business plan that you can put things in. I know it's in the family, but it, it's just, you know, you can do it as you want. Yeah. I, 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 Uh, I mean, so right, yeah. Salesforce is a beast, right? Um, that's that's a big one. Um, I mean, there's there's lighter uh, lighter CRMs out there. I think uh, I think there's like Zoho, there's Insightly, and yeah, you can you can get a laundry list of those. I don't need to yeah, I don't need to rattle those off. Uh, but combination of you know spreadsheet, <laughs> Google spreadsheets, Google Docs, and um, that, that'll that'll take you plenty far. Um, but uh, capturing the detail is also important. So, not just not just those key pieces, <coughs> but having a detailed way to, to, to capture that as well, because it'll allow you to go revisit that and go deeper. <coughs> yeah. Um, quick question on you know the timeline between uh, MVP and MVP. Mm -hmm. Is there a known user friction that you see from market fit because there's <coughs> cost associated with it? Mm -hmm. Is it time to market? What kind of friction do you are okay to negotiate not to? Launch. Yep. So the question was around MVP or MLP, and if there's kind of tension around things that you know you need to fix, what's wha how do you how do you know when you need to fix them? Uh, I wish there was a simple answer for that. Uh, I, th I think it's a matter of uh, you know looking at if if you're looking at your your if you're looking at your assumption around what your market is and who your customers are going to be. Um, what, what do you feel uh, will allow you to kind of reach the <laughs> threshold that, that you feel is appropriate for getting started? So um, what I mean by that is, you know, in our case, uh, part of what we we're looking at is a very specific number of potentially qualified impact investors. So whatever your product or service is, if you're looking at you know, you think that you need to reach a kind of a certain scale in order to really get that feedback or be able to roll something out um, to get you to kind of uh, launch, like officially launch. I think that that's the way to think about it. So it's it's kind of hard to answer that one independent of knowing knowing the business itself. But um, is that is that helpful a little bit just in terms of how you think about it? Yeah, um, in, in most of them. Yeah. yeah, and did you, what reporting process did you use? Was it, was it really just your learning as you talked with people? Obviously, you tried to quantify it, so mm -hmm. did you actually record people? So did you go back to those? Did you sort of analyze what they said, or like what was the? Yeah, good question. I didn't actually take audio. So the question was around uh, whether or not I recorded uh, anything during the discovery process. And uh, so I took very, very detailed notes, and then uh, I didn't audio record on any of them. I, I suppose I could have done that, but I would probably never listen to them. Um, so I took very detailed notes, and then when I was done, um, I would look at the framework that, that we had created, that we had mapped out with the uh, you know, 10, 15 kind of categories that we were trying to kind of quantify or orient around. And then, um, and then, uh, make sure that I was capturing those so that I could look at the kind of high level. And if I noticed um, or kind of had one of those things kind of coming up continuously, let's say I'm 10 conversations in 
and I think to myself, uh, there's been something that's been mentioned every time, and we're these 10 to 15 things that we're kind of capturing um, but don't really uh, don't really allow me to pull out what I'm hearing in that regard. Then you know you're looking back at that and saying, okay, do I need to tweak? Do I need to tweak that to add kind of another column that I'm kind of quantifying so that I have a good sense of that in the future, or is it sufficient? So, is that helpful? Yeah, so did you go back to any of the, I mean, how often did you go back to those notes to have to reanalyze? Yeah. Was that, was that the critical error? Yeah, so going back to the notes and reanalyzing them uh, certainly does come in handy. Uh, that's particularly relevant if you get to the point where you, you, uh, you decide, we're gonna launch. We're gonna launch something from this. You know, we we I, you know I think I think we, we got a good sense of, you know what what uh, how the potential solution that we might offer really maps to the problem. People uh, people seem engaged and, and ready to go. Uh, at that point, you're going back to those because you want to be able to look at the the short list of the people that you think um, are right in that sweet spot and really you know uh, show that. Um, customize your, your messaging to them in a way that, you know, basically you read it and you're like, yes, that's totally for me, right? Um, so that, that's, that's when that comes into effect even more. All right. Yeah? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Right. Um. Right. Yeah, I mean, if, if you can build a platform with a billion people on it, you're going to figure out how to monetize it, most likely, right? So, um, you know, if, if, if you could do that, then, then that's, that's, uh, that's the approach you take. I mean, I think it, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's building something that's meaningful and valuable to people. And, um, and if, if you think, if, if you're not necessarily clear on the, the monetization strategy up front, okay. Um, you know that you know that some segment of your users are going to have to become customers, or that you're going to have to have customers come in somewhere. Otherwise, you don't have a business. Um, but I think keeping the customer in mind, or always always thinking about who that customer is, and figuring out how do you how do you get there as soon as possible with them, is is really important. Um, I, you know, I, I think a, a lot of a lot of the a lot of the startups that that aren't thinking about this, that are only thinking about users, they're they're not going to make it. Most of them don't. I mean, we hear about the ones that do, um, but uh, that's because they're absolutely giant, and um, and um, that, that's kind of how it goes. But uh, so I, I think I would I would just encourage you to always be thinking about the customer. And how they fit in, and how you can really get there with them in terms of closing that first sale or whatever it happens to be. Um, and if users are required to get that customer in, um, then you know you have you have twice the work cut out for you. So, yeah. So you, you said you had a multi-sided platform. Um, do you do you um, typically interview all sides as well? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, when I said kind of multi-sided platform. Uh, the reason being, uh, we're focused on fund managers, um, and they have their own set of needs. And at the same time, uh, one of the factors is if there aren't investors that are looking to invest in these funds, then there are no funds. And so, uh, so we approach them kind of in parallel. Um, uh, so on the one hand, it was about understanding a fund manager's needs. And on the other hand, it was looking at your, uh, your LPs or your investors that would invest in the funds and understanding were there things preventing them from you know, putting money into these emerging market impact funds. And, and so we did, we did those both. Um, and, 
and the, you know, the general feedback. Uh, actually, we took the feedback from both sides and used that to support our, uh, used that to really develop the overarching value proposition. Um, and so, you know, investors on the one hand would be saying, I'm not seeing enough uh, experience or kind of global best practices um, with some of the uh, fund managers that are, that are based uh, in, in different emerging markets. And on the other hand, the emerging uh, the market managers are saying, we can't find the investors. And so, you know, by, able to, by, able to, by being able to come in and help facilitate some of those best practices here, which fits a pain point that met with, that uh, directly addresses fund managers, it also addresses the other side uh, with the investors. Um, so that's, that's how we thought about it in our case. All right. Any other questions? Uh, our process with, with Capria. Uh, so in Capria's case, it was roughly six months uh, to get to the point where we were ready to actually put anything out publicly. But I would also say that there's a little caveat to that because it was based on about a decade of experience before through some other work. Uh, that was done with an existing organization. But um, my, my experience with this just broadly is that six months does seem about right relative to kind of going through um, and at least getting to the point where um, you've kind of, you've done your homework, you've started to map out, um, you know, who you're going to actually go after and get feedback from. You're able to actually connect with those people and get to the right people. You're able to get the feedback from them. You're able to analyze that, and then you're able to think about what it what it means to offer something to those people. Um, and there's a there's a obviously a range there depending on what you're looking to create. But right. So the question was around: Did we pivot in that time? And um, the answer is we were really, uh, in, in some ways, pivoting throughout. Um, and I'm trying to think of the best way to kind of cap capture it. But as we were going through our discovery process, because we weren't, we weren't tied to what it looked like, right? And, and so as we were going through the discovery process, we were constantly having internal conversations around what, what it was that we could offer um, and that we could come out with that would, uh, that would be of material value to people and that would really get people excited. And so that was kind of the pivot part. And then as we've moved into the launch kind of phase, it's been more of a, I would say, of kind of, of an evolution and, and uh, kind of morphing where we started um, and kind of repackaging that um, and, and then uh, building from it as opposed to a pivot. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Well, thank you all for coming out this afternoon. I will uh, stick around for a couple minutes if any of you want to chat. And uh, thank you for, for hosting me here to the, all the commotion folks. And have a good rest of your afternoon, good weekend.
like Mercedes said, we're both 3L students in the clinic um, at the law school. Um, and we're going to be presenting on some of the legal issues in the context of augmented and virtual reality. Um, and just as a disclaimer, um, this is like a presentation and kind of just like general legal issues. Um, we're not giving you legal advice. Um, and if you have real specific legal problems, um, we recommend that you go s seek legal counsel um, on your own. And yeah. All right, so um, before we get started diving into the legal issues, um, we just want to show this, uh, this chart of sort of the AR, VR um, legal issues. So um, Perkins Coie, which is a firm in Seattle, survey about 1,700 um, startups who are working in the AR, VR space. And out of those startups, about 28% of them say that legal issue is a major concern for them. And this is a breakdown of like sort of which area of um, law they're sort of concerned about. So the top one is um, technology and IP licensing. And right underneath that, 18% is product liability. So, and the other ones are IP issues, consumer privacy, um, compliance, right, publicity, and export control issues. And we're gonna cover some of the main ones on this list. Um, and we're just, and so this is the outline of our presentation. We're gonna start with the IP issues, so copyright, trademark, um, and patent. We're gonna start with a very basic concept of each of those area, and then we're gonna use some hypotheticals to really um, to really flesh out the concepts. And after that, we're gonna talk about privacy implications and then product liabilities, and we're just gonna end on where we think um, the area of AR, VR law is gonna go from here. Uh, so copyright. Um, I'm sure all of you have heard of copyright or um, have seen a little C mark on websites or in books or, or just on publications. <coughs> so copyright laws do apply to contents in, um, the, in the v VR world or, like, or um, on AR uh, material. So what a copyright does, it protects the original work of authorship, um, but the work has to be expressed in tangible form. So it has to be on a book, in an e-version, in a recording or something that's sort of tangible that you can see or hear. So what constitute a copyright infringement? So, so something that would be obviously be a copyright is if someone just took the Harry Potter books and like made it into like a magazine, magazine version or a manga version. Um, so that, that would be an obvious case of copyright if they didn't have um, J.K. Rowling's um, permission to do that. But something that's more or that's like more fuzzy is if someone take the characters from the Harry Potter um, universe and like wrote a fan fiction on it or um, did something sort of completely different that someone else wouldn't think that is um, related to J.K. Rowling or if she has anything um, to do with it. So, and for that, there might be a fair use defense. Um, for example, like anything that Alex and I put onto this um, presentation would probably have a fair use of, um, defense because it's, an, it's for educational purposes. Um, so to, to qualify for fair use defense, um, some of the stuff that a court will look at are the purpose and character of the work, um, the nature of the copyrighted work, the amount used, so like whether they use like a whole chunk of like a Harry Potter book or they just use like a short like quote from it, um, and the effect on the market, whether someone using that material would affect um, how many people going in to buy those books. And for s software code um, are usually protectable under copyright laws. Um, so for example, the software code for an AR or VR application might be copyrightable. The functionality of the code isn't. So one way to think about it is like if you have an essay, the content of the essay or like the facts um, or the argument of the essay is not copyrightable, but the words in it um, are so you can't plagiarize an essay by copying it word for word, but you can like summarize it or like use like um, the argument of the essay. And now Alex will talk about trademark. <coughs> yeah, so trademark is another uh, intellectual property area. Um, it protects like word marks or symbols. So like the UW symbol back there um, is like a trademarkable um, and has a trademark, I'm sure. Um, and it that has the, qualifi the qualifier that it's um, something that's used in commerce. So it's basically your 
um, the way that like a company or some business or whatever it is holds themselves out to um, the market when they're selling their goods. Um, so just the branding and things that are um, the way that a consumer sort of associates the brand with the product. Um, and there are other things like a service marker certification marks that um, can sort of give you, that, that have trademark protection but aren't really owned by like the brand itself. Um, so like certified organic, like the USDA organic is a trademark but it's not owned by like the companies that have certified organic foods. Um, <coughs> and another sort of similar uh, idea to trademark is trade dress and it's not something that is registrable like a trademark like you go to the um, the, pan the US Patent and Trademark Office and actually register your trademark with them in order to have um, specific rights related to your trademark. Um, trade dress is sort of the look and feel of your product or your store. So like McDonald's, for example, they, you know, the golden arches and just sort of the, like different colors and different ways that all their restaurants are designed. Um, that might, that's something that is trade dress related as opposed to trademark um, protected. Um, and they're, the, the way that trademarks, or the, it's, they sort of have different strength um, based on the type of word mark or brand mark that it is. Um, and so I have them listed out there, the different types of trademark that there are. Um, so like an, an example of an arbitrary or fanciful word or phrase would be like Google, um, anything that, or Apple and Amazon are sort of arbitrary marks. So like Apple doesn't sell apples, they sell computers. Um, but their, their trademark is a word that is an existing word, but it, it, it's not used to like actually sell like what it says it is, which would be something like descriptive. Um, Google is fanciful, it's a made up word. Um, it doesn't mean search engine, even though we all use it like that. Um, so th as you go down the line, it sort of goes to what the, the strength of your mark is. And, next. and so <clears throat> the way that a trademark is infringed um, is it has to be something that is used in commerce so, and um, it's something that sort of confuses consumers to think that something is um, being sold by that company or um, is sort of purporting to be something that it's not. Um, so it has to do with, you know, operating in the same uh, market or the same geographical area. Um, and that sort of goes in relation to the strength of the mark that, that someone has. So if it's an arbitrary mark, then you'll have a little bit more strength than, um, or like outside of your actual market than if you have a really descriptive mark. So if, I don't know if, if you're using the word Apple to sell something um, in a specific market, it's a little bit more difficult to have it be used in like a different, or to have it protected in a different market when it can be used for different things. Um, and the defenses to infringement claims are abandonment. So if you have a trademark, a registered trademark, um, you have to maintain it. You have to make sure that you protect it. So if you think someone is infringing on it, um, then you have to go out and uh, protect it and take legal action to make sure that you're, you're saying that people can't go out and use this. Um, people other than us can't go out and use our mark. Um, and fair use is similar to the copyright fair use analysis. Um, being able to use like a, a trademark, which is something that can come up in the AR VR space if you're, you know, you're creating another world and you want, you want there to be like a McDonald's on that street or something, then it's arguably that's like a fair use. You're not trying to trick someone into thinking that this is, that we're selling like McDonald's burgers here, but we just kind of want to create like this space that's similar to the real world. Um, and parody and satirical use is another way that um, you can have a trademark infringement defense. So if you're, um, you know, you're, you, the work that you've created is different than like McDonald's if you're using their golden arches in some totally different way, like making a joke about something um, related to it, then um, it's not necessarily holding yourself out to be selling burgers as if you were McDonald's. Um, and some of the remedies that a, a trademark owner can get in an infringement case are 
injunctive relief, which is just preventing someone from continuing to use your mark. Um, you can get the lost profits or the infringer's profits, so profits that they make off of um, using your brand name. Um, you might have a right to those profits and then other damages from just losses related to um, someone else using your mark. Great, so now we're gonna um, use some hypotheticals to really flesh out the concepts of trademark and um, copyright as it relates to AR and VR. Um, so we came up with some potential issues that could come up in VR. So, so um, and we're gonna post this to you and see what you guys um, think um, with regards to these issues. So let's say there's a VR um, producer, alternate universe, um, who makes a virtual hat with a picture of Lady Gaga on it. Do you think there would be any IP infringement issues here? Who owns the photo? Who owns the image? Exactly, <laughs> and that's actually our next point. So um, whoever owns the copyright of the photo could, might be able to bring a copyright infringement suit against um, the producer. So that could be the photographer or Lady Gaga or some uh, third party. Um, another um, issue that we haven't talked about in the previous slides is that um, Lady Gaga could also bring um, a claim for right of publicity. So this is when um, a company or an individual uses another person's identity for commercial purposes. So in this case, if they're selling that Lady Gaga's hat in that um, in alternate universe, then um, Lady Gaga could say, hey, you're using my um, picture and you're making money off of it, um, and I don't like that, so you, you should stop. Um, so, I, so right of publicity, it's, I think right now it's in 30 different states, and it um, and it's not the same in every single state. So it's a state law, um, not a federal law. So I think in California, celebrities have right of publicity after their death, but in some states, um, they don't have that, or their um, estate doesn't have that right. And some of the analysis with right of publicity is like similar to the trademark issues because you, know, you could argue that a celebrity's brand is just sort of like their persona and who they are. Um, so being able, like someone going out and mm -hmm. using their identity to you know, boost up some like sales or whatever. Then, yeah. um, can you argue? That, can you defend it though under the uh, fair use as fair use? Uh, that's. I mean, I'm sure someone would try to do that. Um, it, I, I. I don't know for sure like what the different defenses of right of publicity are like in terms of different states, um, but I think if you were to, I, th I think it's different if you're trying to make money off of like just using like their image versus like creating, you know, Gaty Laga or something, like something that's sort of similar but not the same. Uh, is right of publicity considered to be a, a copyright issue or is it separate from copyright? It's separate from copyright. Yeah. So let's switch up the hypo a little bit. So let's say that this, the picture on the virtual hat is not the exact copy of the photo, but sort of a modification, so like they change the colors and maybe like change what she's wearing or um, change her appearance a little bit. Um, in that case, do you think it's still, it would be protected by copyright? <laughs> what if? You can go. Right. Is it a percentage thing or all that? Yeah, exactly. So it depends on how much um, modification um, and how much change it um, they made to the original photo. Um, if, there, if there's a lot of change, then there's probably a fair use defense. So if there was an app that put a hat on Lady Gaga, that would be, that, that would violate number two. Would yeah, so she stuff. could still bring a right of publicity um, case if they're commercializing off of that, if they're making money off of it. So what if I made a modification to put stuff in the nice car seat that I like, the picture is a picture of Lady Gaga? If they can't recognize that it's a picture of Lady Gaga? Yeah, yeah. It, 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 even though if I modify a lot, I mean, they can still recognize her. Um, for copyright, it, it depends on like what your intention is to. Um, I, generally, if, if it's like a, a lot of modification and um, you're doing it for like a satire purpose or just to poke fun at her, then it's fair use. Uh, for right of publicity, if you're selling that, um, she can still probably bring a claim because there's been a case with um, Samsung um, and Vanna White, where they made a robot that resembled Vanna White, and the robot looks nothing like her because it's um, a robot. Um, but it was like doing like things like um, like turning the things yeah. on the Wheel of Fortune. And and in that case, they still they they said that they um, her right of publicity was violated. 
So it, it, it depends on the sort of like the telling identifiers of that person and their brand. So like kind of what they what the public latches onto and how they identify that person. So in the Vanna White case, like you might not recognize her on the street, but you recognize her like doing the actions for Wheel of Fortune, and that's sort of her like personal brand. So what's the difference in practical terms between the claim for right of publicity versus infringement of trademark? Um, uh, for trademark infringement, you'd have to have a registered mark, probably. But I mean, it would be. I mean, you could probably argue them at the same time. Um, and, um, and so say that certain right things are. Or if you look at them at the same, um, the same, would the penalty be the same? No. It, de it really depends on the facts. Yeah. Um, so that's the thing with law, it's like a lot of it depends on the actual facts. Um, but right of publicity only applies to um, natural persons. So like a company like Madonna could have a trademark, um, but they, can't, they don't have a right of publicity. But Alex and I, um, under some state law, we would also have right of publicity, even though we're not celebrity. So he might have gotten a license from Campbell Suit or like um, had some kind of like contract with them, but I'm not sure what the particular facts are. Yeah, I'm not sure about that one, and and I think too it's some of the, the some of the the requirements for trademark infringement is that you're that there's a likelihood of confusion of like the, uh, on the consumer's part, um, and so I don't think anybody would you know look at Andy Warhol's painting or like buy a print of it and be thinking that they're going to buy, you know, a Campbell's soup. So in that way, he's, he's sort of separate. They're not operating in the same market. Um, yeah. All right, I'm gonna keep going with this hypo. Um, so what if it was an alternate universe who was making the Lady Gaga's photo, but like, um, like a user of the um, platform? So who do you think would be in trouble in this case? Peter. Okay. Um, so yeah, um, so I think in this case, like they'll probably like, send like something to Peter, like, hey, you should remove this. Um, this is violating a copyright. Um, and yeah, your alternate ear is probably okay um, if it does that. Um, because there's this thing called a Digital Millennium Copyright Act Safe Harbor where um, where if content or if platform provider like make sure that um, they they give like information to their user about not like violating copyright and if they take the reasonable steps to ensure that their users are not violating copyright then they're usually okay. Um, so sort of like twisting this a little bit, what if they were aware of the infringement? Um, and they encourage content from third parties that uses um, figures from popular culture. So there might be um, contributor liability from the provider. Yeah, so that basically means that, um, I mean, the liability would sort of go to the individual using it, but um, AU in this case, since they're sort of suggesting their users do that, um, the liability could be attached to them as well. and. I'm sure the person who you know create or Lady Gaga in this case, who has like the the work that's being protected by intellectual property, would want to go after AU and not Little Peter because AU has deeper pockets, presumably. Um. So um, just continuing with the, these AU hypo, um, say there's a virtual user on AU who is wearing shoes that resemble um, Nike's like latest line of um, running shoes. Any thoughts? Um, this is a trick question because since we haven't covered um, <laughs> fashion, but there's generally no copyrights for fashion design because the clothing is considered a useful article, but if there's like a special pattern or design on um, that piece of clothing, then that could be copyrighted. And I think um, issues like these and sort of the rest of on this slide 
are, are where some of the trademark and copyright issues in AR and VR get interesting because in the infringement context, there's, um, there's often like, there's a requirement that you're operating in the same market, um, that, like, that you're trying to you know, sell a similar good. Um, but you could argue that, you know, a, like a McDonald's or something, you're not selling burgers in virtual reality the same way that McDonald's is selling burgers in real life. Like, if you're walking into that place, you, you're not, you know, doing, you're not operating in the same market as them. And so, it's an interesting way. It's it's going to be interesting to see how a lot of these things kind of flush out. And I think a lot of bigger brands will have protection in those cases because they will argue that it's just sort of their brand as a whole that's being harmed um, if they make an art, if, if they really are being harmed, but um, just sort of like the feeling that people get around them and, and they'll want to go out and protect their trademarks because that's a requirement of them. Yeah, so like in the case of the Nike shoe, if it's like so recognizable that anyone like seeing that would like immediately thought of Nike, then they could still have like a trademark um, case. Um, so what if there's a place inside the um, VR universe that's exactly like Hogwarts? Um, does this infringe on like J.K. Rowling's like copyrighted books or Warner Bro um, Brothers rights? Yes, because they created an exact copy of oh. their copyright. Yeah, did you? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, this would be something that's called derivative work. So it's work that's derived from like the original um, work. And and um, J.K. Rowling would have copy um, right over that. But is there a fair use defense? Um, it sort of, again, depends on the facts. So like, um, it depends on what they're doing with that replica and how it's um, being used in <coughs> the alternate universe. Yeah, I mean, I think if someone goes out and creates you know, Hogwarts and an AR space or VR space, that inherently doesn't you know infringe on on their rights necessarily. But if you go out and try to you know commercialize that, that's where the issues come up. And um. what if they had um, a character that resembled like Luke Skywalker? Would that be a copyright issue? Does it resemble Luke Skywalker? <laughs> Good question. <That's laughs> um, oops, you're. Ex um, yeah, you're exactly right. So, um, so that's one of the that's one way that they look at it. And another thing is, it depends on how developed Luke Skywalker is. And Luke Skywalker is a pretty developed character. So, there's a case that um, his character is copyright, but if it's just like some random character from like um, that was like in one episode of The Simpsons, then they probably won't be able to get copyright for that character. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to go through like the whole. You guys are probably getting tired of hypos <laughs> by now. <laughs> <laughs> Just put them all up there. Um, yeah, so these are some other more specific like trademark issues that, that I kind of mentioned earlier. Um, like if, if the alternate universe company has a you know McDonald's in their um, in their space, in their VR you know world, you know, they might be infringing. It depends on kind of how the the market is defined and how um, how readily McDonald's wants to protect its um, its IP, and in the case of Always Burger, like it's sort of a trade dress trade dress thing, like a like sort of a knockoff. Like if this thing looks like McDonald's, but it's not called McDonald's, it's you know arguably you know trying to make it seem like the same thing. But again, that's you're also like one step removed from real life. Like if if this was in you know just down the street from McDonald's and Always Burger was like trying to make it look like it's the same exact thing would be a, probably a bigger issue than if it's you know in a burger store in a VR world. Um, and yeah, so you can leave that up there and the whole slide. Um, a, a lot of these issues are, as I mentioned before, it, it comes up that like the, the brands have the trademarks and, the, and those things have to be being used in commerce and there's sort of a commercial aspect to the infringement as well. Um, and so it gets complicated when you're you know, creating worlds or if you're AR, say you had like an AR version of Yelp where you kind of like hold your phone up and like you can see the different restaurants on the street 
And if you use, you know, like Chipotle's logo because you're right outside of Chipotle, arguably that's not infringement. You're not, you know, taking away from Chipotle's market. You're um, just sort of like showing that that is there. That's a fair use. Um, Um, so, in the case of copyright with relation to augmented reality, um, say there's an AR game company that films the Seattle Art Museum, which includes painting of s um, several artists. Um, so there could be a copyright issue here, and it depends on sort of how long those paintings have existed. If they existed between 1923, then they're public um, domain, so that means anyone can use them for pretty much anything. Um, and for if say if an AR company films a Barnes and Noble bookstore um, that include videos of titles of various books, is that a copyright issue? Um, probably not. Um, titles of books are usually not copyrightable. Um. Yeah. So um, we have another example, like if sort of what um, this gentleman over here was kind of hinting at, like if you could you know create something. That, put, that uses a trademark to you know, augment like a photo that you have. And in this case, this would definitely be a, um, a trademark infringement, um, especially if the app is being sold. Um, yeah. So. so yeah, so how to not infringe on copyright and trademark. Um, getting licenses for the things that you are using um, is one way to do it. Um, there, it can be sort of complicated just depending on the different um, marks or works that you're using. Um, but I think focus, trying to focus on you know, using works that are either original or like in the public domain and you're, not, um, you're making sure that you're not trying to um, sort of co-opt what the brands, the, like the brand like value that they've already created um, for your own benefit. Um, those are sort of, a little, sort of safe harbor kind of things. Um, and implementing sort of internal controls like review process to make sure that um, you know items or things that are put into the AR or VR um, space that you're creating that you can um, that you that you're just aware of everything that you're using all the different um, pr protected things by other parties um, and going off of what the the specific user of the hypothetical company having language in the user agreement that says that um, the unauthorized use of protected works is prohibited and um, that they will have to, or that the, you know, the platform has the ability to take down um, infringing or possibly infringing um, works. Um, and so moving to patents, and I, and I will disclaim that I'm not a patent um, attorney and I'm not focusing on that. So um, this is a little bit more basic. Um, hopefully you're at the Patent 101 um, presentation a few weeks ago. But a patent um, is protection on a useful, um, useful item, like an invention. Um, it must be patent patentable subject matter, which is um, a machine manufacturer, composition, process, or any useful improvement. Um, the invention has to be useful, new, and non-obvious. Um, those are all things that will that are just general for patents um, across the board, not specifically AR and VR type things, um, and and they're difficult and time uh, time consuming and costly to obtain. Just the patent prosecution um, process. So a lot, I mean, a lot of times, um, companies that might be thinking about going and trying to get a patent, it, they have to do sort of a value um, based analysis of the value of going through the time and the effort and the cost of um, trying to get a patent versus just keeping um, everything secret among their uh, in their company and protecting it that way. Um, and yeah, the, the patent prosecution application process takes a little over two years. Um, and sp specifically to, to AR and VR, these are, that's kind of hard to read, but um, that's the, the companies that have patents in this space, and it's a lot of the big companies, Magic Leap, Microsoft, Sony, Samsung, um, Disney, Intel, Nintendo, Google. Um, they're all sort of operating in this space, and it's, it's as, as 
more and more patents um, are issued, the ability to get a patent on something in this space shrinks because it's, not, it's no longer new, it's no longer um, non-obvious. Um, so you almost have to, depending on the product, depending on the invention, you have to kind of bank on patenting some like niche portion of it. Um, so they could arise in, in hardware, um, but also the software, although the patentability of software is kind of um, more of a challenging issue since they since a recent Supreme Court case um, in 2014. Um, and it's it's a it's a competitive market and so they're um, and a lot of since it's new and growing and, and it's developing, a lot of the companies that are out there that have patents um, might be likely to go out and try to make sure that they're protecting um, their interests and preventing um, infringement. So it might be the case that you will want to, you know, find out what the what the patents are if you're creating a similar thing and think about maybe, you know, licensing the type of um, the inventions that are already existing and patented um, for your use. Um, and some of the, another kind of non-IP related um, issue in AR and VR and just sort of inherent in technology companies in general is um, privacy issues, which is becoming more and more um, of a concern of just the general public as people are becoming more aware of just how much information um, about them is shared online and, um, and companies are becoming more and more aware of the usefulness of that information. Um, so there, when Google Glass originally was released in San Francisco, there were several restaurants and bars and other places that um, wouldn't allow people to wear Google Glass in their establishment because they didn't want their consumers, um, their customers to be recorded without their consent, or they, maybe they didn't want the inside of their store or their restaurant to be recorded without their consent. Um, so that creates some issues. And some things to think about as well for um, companies in this space is just the information that is collected, how, it's protect, how, you, how you protect that information from um, security breaches, and just how it's being shared with other companies. Um, and making sure that you're protecting and maybe like having some layer of like anonymity to your um, data protection so that people's personal information, which can be, um, it's, it's not just, you know, your date of birth address, um, credit card information, it, especially in like VR and AR spaces where you're actually, you know, you're doing things in those spaces and, and what you're, you know, the actions that you're taking are, have to be sort of recorded in some way by the platform. Um, it's that sort of information about you, like about what you're doing, about you know the things that you're looking at or the actions that you're taking, um, and that can create a really robust profile about who you are. That's useful in many different ways to people that you might not want to have access to that information. So, um, just making sure that that stuff is kind of protected and and that con consumers can be satisfied with um, their interactions with that space and not feel like they're being violated just by using it. So as you saw in the very first graph that we show, like um, products and personal liability is another issue that um, AR, VR startups could face. Um, I mean, we, well, we don't know too much about the tech side, but uh, we've heard that there's like stuff like motion sickness, um, possible like eye strain, and there's been some like talk about seizures, and, um, and there's other issues with like, um, I think we've probably seen from the Pokemon Go uh, phenomenon, there's like mm -hmm. where there's nuisances caused by other people running around um, people's property, um, catching Pokemon, trespassing, and um, we're also going to talk a bit about virtual trespass. Um, so from the AR perspective, um, so for Pokemon Go, like, um, so like, if, what if a player gets injured looking for a Pokemon? I remember reading an article um, that two guys fell off a cliff looking for a Pokemon. Um, so all of this, again, um, it depends on like the fact of what happened and, um, but there was a court case that says Snapchat wasn't at fault when a user tried to go 100 miles per hour um, to use the speed filter and got into an accident. Um, so that um, is good, that's a good sign for AR or VR um, <laughs> startups. And then for the trespassing, it's, so Niantic got sued um, in these three, in these two instances, and I think there are a couple others, and the cases are still pending, so we don't know how they're going to come out. But it's likely that 
um, the court probably won't find Niantic liable for the action of the player. And especially since the company has um, explicitly discouraged these action and has like warnings on the games. Um, but it'll be interesting to see how those cases play out. And then the VR case, um, like if someone fell in a cliff in the VR but somehow like fell in real life, um, that could be a potential issue and um, that person could bring case against the VR company. But a lot of these are, has not been contested at court so we don't, we're not completely sure how it'll come out. Um, but what can AR and VR provide providers do to protect themselves? Um, so like the Pokemon Go case, like they've had warnings about sa safety issues and um, and other things. They can have warnings about health problems and a company could possibly provide health tips for using their um, AR or VR products. Um, and the licenses and terms of services should include a provision that prohibit user from breaking the law and um, disclaiming the provider's own liability if the user do break the law. Um, so these disclaimer, like they're, sometimes they work, sometimes <laughs> it, they don't. Um, it really depends on like um, what the actual facts and like what happened in each um, case. And other precautions, like for a VR game, they could like police um, the virtual locations. Um, and I think the user service agreement is an is a good spot to like sort of have some of these clauses. Um, so an AR VR company could like talk with an attorney and come up with like, um, like for example, an arbitration clause would um, would help save um, costs. So it it will like require users to go through arbitration before they can like sue the company directly. Or a choice of law provision would be, um, I think, beneficial for the AR VR company because they could choose um, the which the law of whether um, the law of Washington or the law of California applies. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a lot of us are startups in VR. Is there a generic disclaimer that we can use for people who are experienced or using our product either before sale or now it's at market? Is there a generic use? language out there? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm. So we don't yeah. have, have to all customize and call for yeah. effort. Right, exactly. I think. Um, I think there might be places where you could take from other agreements that are out there um, and sort of in some way kind of yeah. customize it to you, what you need. Because um, a lot of companies are also trying to support on local platforms, mm -hmm. right. usually the heavy hitters, but there's also the smaller platforms too, and who knows what their legal, right. um, and interpreting that is also challenging right. to yeah. see what it will or will not cover, but it would be helpful. Yeah. I <laughs> come up with <laughs> generic <laughs> language, yeah. Then I think it depends on the individual company and like what kind of like service they're providing. I know like Snapchat, like in their limitation of liability clause, they say that oh, um, yeah. as much as possible under the law, we limit our liability. Yeah. So, right. but it might be something that of, uh, of like looking at like what Oculus has or other companies that actually have like stuff out there right now and and like becoming a user of them and seeing what you agree to and then taking sort of like right. yeah. what yeah. they have in their user, user agreement. agreement. We're going to end with sort of um, where we see AR and VR law going. So uh, neither of us have a crystal ball, but um, we think that as AR and VR become more widespread, the law will be more developed. Um, and with the adopt um, the future adoption of 5G te technology, um, I think we're going to see more AR and VR uses on mobile technologies. And once that happens, there could be new regulations regard um, regarding these uses and restricting like um, maybe like um, limit, limiting the uses in public spaces. Um, and depending on how health issues come up, there might be more health regulations. And did you have a question? Yeah. Oh. I just think one of the, I mean, kind of just with all of these, uh, the, the issue with a lot of just developing technologies in general, what have you seen you know, throughout the decades, is that the technology is moving a lot quicker than the law. And the law, as issues come up, it's sort of like, tries to shoehorn the new technology into what's already existing. It takes a while for it to catch up. Um, so it's, so it, yeah, it's interesting to see, to kind of think about how um, 
where AR and VR things will be fit into existing frameworks, and then when will be the breaking point to when um, you know, specific things come out related to AR and VR. Um, I mean, it's, it's definitely, I mean, it's obviously a new place, it's a new um, market, and there's, there's just literally, there's just not a lot on it. And so it's, it's interesting to see, it'll, it will be interesting to see how everything kind of adapts um, to it. For example, like virtual groping, like that's something that's never existed before. So how would um, the law resolve that would be an interesting question. Um, and there could possibly be like conflicts of law issues. Say there's a VR universe where there's players from like China, from the US, from France, like which law apply and, um, and how would that work out? And if virtual assets become like something that's more in use, then there could be some issues with taxation, like which um, like which state collects a tax on like um, virtual transactions. Um, and that sums up our presentation. So um, thank you for being here in the afternoon. And <laughs> if you guys have any additional questions, we'll be happy to take them. And um, even though we, we're not providing like um, legal advice at this presentation, we, we're both with the Entrepreneurial Law Clinic and the Entrepreneurial Law Clinic helps startups. Um, so if you guys, are interested in learning more, we have the link up here and you can email the clinic um, with your questions as well. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I would think so. I would think that's one of the places where like it'll be shoot, sort of shoehorned, yeah. Because um, I think, and a lot of the ways that I've thought about um, these issues, I think it's it's easy to sort of put it into something that's already existing and, it's, and to argue that it's not that different from like sitting down at your couch and watching a movie as and like sitting down on your couch with you know a VR headset on and you know looking around. It's kind of the same principles. All that stuff is still there. It's just sort of the delivery is different. Um, so for example, are you familiar with carpool karaoke? Mm -hmm. 